Awesome. You know, it's, it's, so, it's so interesting, and I'm, I'm so thankful that even in a group like this, you open up with, with Psalms 20 as a prayer for Israel. Um, that's a rare thing these days in houses of worship. Um, and even in the Christian community, we're finding that I'm finding I'm shocked in both directions. I'm shocked at the ones that are supporting that I may not have thought of would be, and I'm shocked at the ones that I thought would be ardent supporters of Israel and have actually turned their backs. So you're seeing a conglomeration of things. We're in a situation now where there's, there's literal thought chaos going on around the world. There's paradigm chaos. It's chaotic. And God is not the author of chaos, right? He's not the author of confusion. He's a God of order. He's a God that, that has stated in his word over and over and over again that his people are his firstborn. And, and so when, when we see what we're seeing today, I'm sure you've asked yourself the question, how in the world can this be going on? How in the world can believers in Jesus, even if they don't know him as Yeshua, how can they serve a Jewish king and not serve the, understand that we're supposed to serve the Jewish Jewish people. Isn't that kind of a yeah. just a just a weird question that you would even have to ask? Why even do we have to ask that question? Right? It's just it's just bizarre. And so I'm gonna I love to open up with one song in particular, and but I want to share just a little bit because I just from my heart, um, I was sharing with with Brother Garrett this morning that my son is 22 years old and I'm. He's leaving the house in two weeks for good. I mean, he's, he's launching out into his career. He's a pilot. He's a flight instructor. He was just hired by American Airlines and Envoy, one of their regional carriers. But it's a, he's in a cadet program to get all of his hours and all that. He's fully certified. But when in our family, raising my three kids, we, we, do, we had uh, what we called uh, not bar and bat mitzvahs. We had bar and bat brit, son and daughter of the, of the covenant. And then basically it's just a... A, a new covenant version of a bar mat bat mitzvah, same elements to the kind of the ceremony, but we obviously focus it on Yeshua and who he is and, you know, becoming of age. Well, when I, when, when Levi was, was come to that point, we took, I took him to Israel for his first time and got to go up to the Temple Mount, which I'd been there before, but there is a jihad school right there on the Temple Mount next to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the windows were open. I was standing from about here to that wall. We were standing, we couldn't go any closer. But the windows were open and the children were in there and they were doing their daily chants, which was death to the Jew, death to Israel, death to America. And they were repeated and repeated and repeated. And I told him what they were saying. And he's just standing there looking at him. And so when this war broke out, I said, can you think about how many of those children you saw 10 years ago are actually the ones that are participating in this war? Because at, an, at those ages, you, as you all know, once you're, in, once you're infiltrated with those thoughts and those paradigms and the way that of thinking, it, it's very difficult to unearth that. It takes a miracle of God, which is what is happening right now with Hamas. Believe it or not, God is visiting Hamas insurgents underground, and they're seeing visions, and they're coming to Yeshua on their own without anybody sharing the gospel. There's miraculous supernatural happenings. The underground church in um, in in Gaza is reporting many of these insurgents coming to Christ. They're coming to Christ as a result of nobody sharing the gospel, just simply Yeshua visiting them, and it's amazing. So. You know what? God is going to God is going to make this happen. And this I'm going to share a little bit today about what I feel like is the answer to to Psalms 20 as we pray as we pray that whole chapter. It's a declaration and a request. But I believe that in, even as it's really interesting that the parsha for last week, this week and next week are kind of all tied together and they actually explain the answer to that question. It's it's an amazing amazing thing. But um, I do want to share just a little bit about the ministry before I, I get into the word of the Lord. Um, our ministry is called Eagles Nest Ministries International, and, and that came out of the scripture that as the, as the eagle stirs its nest, so do I stir over you, Israel. And so um, I just, oh, thank you. Okay. And so 
what we do is we go, we have been ministering for the last four years, uh, sp specifically to Holocaust survivors in Israel. There's over 150,000 left plus. In fact, it, as, they, as the attrition happens because of the Ukraine-Russia war, they have gained more because of the exodus out of Ukraine, especially uh, from Ukrainian Jews back into the making Aliyah into Israel. And so what we do is we have teams on the ground and they two by two go to the homes of these shut-ins because even though Israel is a socialist state and does provide food and medicine and takes care of the survivors, they have to make it to the distribution centers or at least have a family member or somebody to bring it. 40% of the, of the survivors are shut-in. I was with several in, in, in September in Israel and uh, we had a dinner, for, we hosted a dinner with our team. We were there two weeks before the war broke, the war broke out. I was literally leaving the day before um, Yom, Ter Yom Terah. And when we arrived at our hotel in Jerusalem, there was five minutes before we arrived, there was a, a Palestinian stabbing of two tourists right outside the, the door of our hotel. So that it was already precipitating, you know, up into what we saw happen on October 7th. So um, y y there's a lot of things going on, but we have, been ministering to them for several years, and we, in two years, we have seen 46, 46 survivors profess Yeshua uh, as a result. I mean, the Lord spoke to me in 2019. He said, I want you to go. I want, he said, I want my remnant to know me. And I'm in prayer. I'm like, oh, that doesn't make sense to me. I thought the remnant is the one who knows you. They're, we're the remnant, right? I mean, isn't that what we're called? And I'm praying. I keep repeating this back to the Father. I'm saying, I, I don't understand. And he said, I want my remnant to know. He just repeated it. I said, okay, what am I missing here? So when you look at the word remnant in Hebrew, it's the word sarid, and you can see right there at the top at where sarid, it means a people who have been persecuted and gone through tumultuous times. Immediately I knew it was the survivors, the remnant of the survivors. He wants them to know me, is what he was saying. And we endeavored and embarked on an, an opportunity to reach out into their community, which is very difficult to do. They have three government agencies that strictly govern, but through a friend of mine who one of his board members was recently put on, and this was three years ago, was recently put on one of the boards in, in Israel overseeing the survivors. Now remember, he's a believer in Yeshua, and he's on a state board overseeing survivors. That's, that just doesn't happen. That just does, that's called favor. That's just called God's favor. And so through that connection and all of that, we started to increase the teams on the ground. We began to fund those. And even through COVID, it was, um, it was, it was something that, 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 that took place. And so we have that going on. But since the war started, we, have, we started a fund right after day two of the war. The Lord just dropped into my heart. I started a fund, and we, start, we started uh, reaching out to, with my friend Pastor Salim in Nazareth. Now, Pastor Salim... It's probably the only Arab pastor in Israel of a, of a church that celebrates the feasts, but even goes beyond celebrating. This is an Arab church celebrating. They celebrate, they, 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 they study Torah, they, they celebrate the feasts, and they reach out weekly to the Jewish communities around Nazareth with, with, with food packages and, and, and hygiene products and all kinds of things. Well, the thing is, is when the war broke out, he already had that system set in a small set, you know, way. All he had to do was up his game and begin to, he says, well, we're going to take this down to southern Israel. Now, that's a two and a half hour drive, right? So he just said, hey, Mike, we're going to just start this. And so let me just kind of share with you, Pastor Salim. I'm, I'm not going to touch on this. So why do we pray for Israel? I think you guys understand that. I'm actually going to share a little bit about Second Chronicles 20. But here's Pastor Salim. I'm going to let him speak for a minute. For our friends and donors and supporters in Eagle's Nest Ministry, I'm sending this video to thank you for your generosity, for your love, for standing with us in this project. We already have 500 hygiene products for the families that affected by the war. Right? Hundred include toothbrush, include toothpaste, a body shower, a soap, a shampoo, a toilet paper, a 
all the needs like uh, wet ones, uh, towels, or face and body. Uh, also, in addition, we add sweets for the children and uh, uh, different kinds of sweets and biscuits. So we are adding all this because of your love. I'm really, I'm sending you thanks from the bottom of our heart. We thank you for your generosity. We thank you. We will not forget this generosity that you showed to us. Blessing Israel and the people in Israel. We are going to continue tomorrow with 200 more. 200 more, but this time food packages to help all the families and to show the love of Yeshua. To be light in darkness. Reconciliation is our message. Love is our message. Building bridges between our villages, that is our message. And can you imagine when they receive the boxes that are written in every box, home of Jesus the King Church in Nazareth? That is amazing because also three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and English, it's written about Jesus. He went about doing good, go and do likewise. That is our message. We thank you. Please continue. Continue donating. That will help us to reach more and more families. We pray that soon we can reach these families by visiting them. Pray for the peace because the situation is not easy, especially in the borders of Lebanon. We are near the border. So we need the peace. We need the Prince of Peace, Jesus. We love you and may God bless you. Amen. So um, this is, I, I'm not going to play the video for sake of time, but this is um, Mayor Ronan Plot of Hagalil, which is one of the areas in southern Israel that was affected by the initial attack on October 7th, and, and, and Pastor Salim and him have become fast friends and close friends, and so uh, the doors to be opened now are to go into these areas and minister, and I'm actually heading back in the in the mid part of February to work with Pastor Salim and other and a couple other ministries there to do the very thing, same thing. Um, oh, we do have a uh, conference coming up in March. If you're interested, it's 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 Israel, the Kingdom of God, and you, myself, and if you know uh, George and Bat Rivka Witten, uh, Bat Rivka is an Israeli worship artist, and George is uh, with Worthy News. We're doing a conference up in Mandarin at uh, Grace Life Church. So that's March 8th and 9th. You can go to our website at ENMI Life and find everything. Love for you to just join us. We also have our Healing Wings project. So this is happening next year um, as a part of our, our Operation Brother Shield. Now, the Operation Brother Shield and Healing Wings is as a result of a, an incredible, God given divine appointment um i have direct now we have our ministry has direct input with the idf it's unbelievable we are connected with the idf the head of procurement the head of procurement is the guy who gets all the personal items for an idf soldier he is in charge of getting jackets and tools and all of this stuff and he's be we become very close friends and so we're actually funding items that the IDF needs. And then this right now we're working on is, and I didn't bring it with me, but it's a, a multi-tool combination with a tactical headlamp. So when they go into the tunnels, it's a, you know, they can, they can see this. So we're actually funding this. Um, and the Healing Wings Project, you're going to love this. Uh, and you heard Pastor Salim mention the, the children. He's actually stepped up into a new area, just a small area with the children. And, and this is going to kind of tie into that. Um, they've brought together counselors, both messianic and, and psychiatrists in Israel, to develop an activity pack for children between the ages of four and eight years old so that they can that have experienced the trauma of the war so they can disconnect from the war. And, have, and it's an art, art pack and drawings and colorings and all kinds of puzzles and things. They're $8 a piece. Um, Brother Ed, is, is, he's got a group that's going to gonna fund 1,000 units for us to send over there just for the kids. Now watch this, with my friend uh, Tamir, he asked and called me, he says, Mike, would you be willing to host uh, 50 to 100 children, Israeli children affected by the war? I said, and I have a friend who does activity camps, sports and activity camps, and I called him, I said, would you be willing? He said, whatever you need. So we're gonna bring 50 to 100 children plus a parent or a guardian, so it's gonna be about 200 people in, co in connection with the state of Israel 
and in connection with LL Airlines, who are paying the, the airfare, to bring them to Jacksonville in the spring to have an activities camp, and then we'll connect them with one of the, uh, probably with the Chabad over on South Side, my friend uh, Rabbi Shmuley over there. And so this is called the Healing Wings Project, that, that they will receive healing in, in the wings you know, because of his wings. So um, you can learn more about that at our website. So God has just really opened up a lot of things. This is another thing we were funding, uh, specialized tank equipment where they can multiply, they can target multiple targets at one time. If you wonder why the reason is, for example, IDF soldiers aren't getting killed as much as the insur insurgents, it's because of their body armor. Their body armor is what's called a level four. Level four will block a armor piercing round. And um, so uh, I'm with working with Tamir, they don't need funding for body armor. The problem with the body armor is not the funding. The problem is making it. It takes a long time to make one armored vest. I mean, it's level of over after level after level of ceramics and different things. So they have designated funds for that. They don't have designated funds for the winter coats and the tools and everything that a soldier needs to keep on. So that's what we're helping to fund. Okay. And we're actually working with a company called Safari Land in Jacksonville. You might have heard of it. They're a tactical weapons company. They have some of the contracts. And I actually, he, Tamir sends me the IDF uh, purchase orders. I mean, they're in Hebrew and they're direct and says, look, I'm not trying to make money here. This is what it costs. You can fund this, we'll fund it. So that's what we're doing. So we're doing a lot of different things. We also do tours to Israel. Um, I believe this, and, and I have two friends in the Knesset. We, we, there's the thinking that this war is going to take about six to eight to nine months more, hopefully shorter than later. Um, but we do have a tour plan for 2025. It's locked in. It's going to be uh, eight, eight day, nine days in Israel and two days in Greece. So we're going to go visit a couple of the churches that the Apostle Paul visited. So if you're interested, everything is on our website at enmi.life. It's a brand new website, um, has everything there. And if you're interested in any of that, there's a contact form. Please fill it out. I have cards on the table. You can fill those out. Um, would love to partner with you. And if you want to invest in any of these projects, and I call, I don't say donate, if you want to invest because you're saving Jewish lives, either a soldier's life or a child's life, or you're bringing in the gospel with Pastor Salim down to, down to some of these families. So we'd love to, to partner with you. I'll leave that up there. Amen. Amen. Any, any questions? Do you guys have any questions? I mean, feel free. I mean, just I, I'll answer anything that you, that you might have a, a question about. Um, I, I don't want it to see. Go ahead. Yeah, there was only one kibbutz that was able to do that and, and uh, defend against the insurgency because they were, yeah. yeah and both of them now, they're allowing them, they're mm -hmm. not able to access personal weapons. So, yeah, unfortunately in the last few years, it used to be that the law was that they wanted every Israeli family to have at least one weapon in the home, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes sense, right? Yeah, um, and... The last few years, and this is what was happening. So this actually started in the early uh, early 90s. If you remember Prime Minister Ehud uh, Barak, he was Prime Minister around 2000. His father was the Supreme Court Head Justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. And this is, this is what precipitated the huge divide you heard about the riots that before the war of the Israelis walking from Tel Aviv to Israel, and they were protesting the Supreme Court decision, the decisions with Netanyahu causing a huge division in the nation. Well, his father was very liberal. His father was um, a Supreme Court justice and began legislating from the bench. And the Knesset just went along with anything he said. So because Israel doesn't technically have a constitution, they have a parliamentary form of government. So once, once, when an Israeli citizen votes, they don't vote for a person, they vote for a party. That's why they have, right now, I think it's 15 political parties in Israel. They don't vote for a person, and when they vote for that party, that party decides who's going to be in the seat in the Knesset. Not you don't vote for the actual representative like we do in our nation. So that that there's some disconnect with, between the people. That's why it's a semi-socialist state. And so when he started doing this, he did this for several years, five, six, seven years, I can't remember. And as a result, they institute a lot of liberal policies. Hence getting the, you know, the, the taking away of, of weapons in the home and so forth. And so they're finding, obviously, that was a 
very bad decision because the examples of the kibbutz, uh, I can't remember the name of the kibbutz, but the one girl who was the head of security, she had just finished her service. She was put in head of, head of security and she saw, she got the weapons unlocked and they already had a, she had already developed a security plan and they were able to fend off. Uh, and I was like two dozen or you know, 30 or so insurgents and, and save that whole kibbutz. You know, you're exactly right. So um, I think that's, it's a, there's a good chance that's gonna change. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of checks and balances on how you can have a weapon, but I'm, I'm hearing some rumblings of some things that are gonna change. Uh, and right now they're just trying to win the war. And, and the big, big question of, it's not, they've actually already won. They've actually already won the, the Hamas part of it. Right now it's cleanup. I mean, this is like, uh, this is like, you know, we're on the back side of this. They've already won this war. It's a matter of cleanup at this point. So um, the question now is, what's going to happen in the north? That's the... Well, they're, they're going to control Gaza. That's not going to be, even be a thing. They're going to they're going to control it. But what's gonna, what the question is, is, is the 300,000 Hezbollah that are in Lebanon and Syria at the northern border. That's the big question. Are they going to invade? Or are they not going to invade? Um, there's some other things I, I probably can't share, but there's some, they, they do have some weapons that are very, very strong, and um, that will, there's a, there's a uh, preventative that's, I mean, they would have invaded already had they thought that they could not be wiped out by what Israel has. So um, anyway, any other questions? Mm-hmm. Abso, abso, well, not host families because because they're going to be put up in hotels and stuff. They're very protective, so you know. There's, but for the for the camp and for other activities, yes. So if you want more information about that, please either fill out a card or go online to our website and just fill out the contact form at the bottom. And I'm, I'm I've had a lot of people ask about being a part of that, and so absolutely, yes, Garrett. Yep, ENMI will, will go right to the ministry, and um, uh, we will, right now I'm focusing on uh, working with Pastor Salim when I get there in February, and I'm taking a, about five people with me, just, it, it's, a, it's, it's a work, brutal trip, I mean, we're staying in kibbutz, and, you know, I said, it's not like the tour we had, we're five-star hotels, this is going to be like one to, two, one to two star kind of hostel type situation, so... <laughs> You got to be able to be, be a little be a little flexible, right? So let's. I'm just gonna. You know, there's this one song that I like to 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 minister because it 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 is the heart of the Lord for the peace of Jerusalem. So, and if you know it. Um, Shalom, shalom, Jerusalem. Peace be to you. When Messiah comes to take us home, may his praise be found in you. Pray for peace, Jerusalem, city of our God. Where salvation poured out for you, the atoning of the Lord. Watch your streets filled with joy branches laid on high shouting blessed be the holy one Yeshua Adonai Shalom Shalom Jerusalem be to you when 
when Messiah comes to take us home, may his praise be found in you. Israel, you're my beloved. Ephraim, my son, how my heart would thrill to hear you say, the Messiah has come. Oh, my brothers, hear these words. May they pierce your soul. Turn again to worship Adonai. Yeshua, you will know. Shalom, shalom, Jerusalem. Peace be to you. When Messiah comes to take us home, may his praise be found in you. Peace, shalom, shalom, Jerusalem. Peace be to you. When Messiah comes to take us home. May his praise be found in you. May his praise be found in you. Hallelujah. So I really want to share about, again, answering that prayer, having that prayer answered in Psalm 20, which God is doing. Um, I think we prayed about miracles happening in Israel, and I can share a couple of those with you. In fact, on October 7th, uh, one of the, there was a, a believing messianic uh, woman and her daughter and they saw the insurgents come in and she ran and hid in her bedroom with her daughter closed the door and heard the insurgent outside and he punched through the glass of the window and come to find out he had sliced his the, his forearm pretty badly when he did that he came in and he could hear he could he could hear him walking around he was he came up right to the door of the bedroom they thought for sure they're gone and the door never opened, and he could hear, they could hear steps, and then there was silence, and they stayed there for about 30 more minutes, and they heard a voice in Hebrew, so this is the IDF, this is the IDF, anybody here, anybody here, and they said, yes, we're in the bedroom, and then when they walked out, there was a blood trail, and there was a pool of blood in front of the bedroom door, a pool of blood in the other, in front of the other bedroom door, he never opened the door, and their lives were completely spared. I mean, you don't, you're talking about how close can you come to, to destruction. Um, and more recently, this is what our prayers are doing. This is what prayer is actually happening. And I did want to did want to mention that if you sign up on the with us, we do, we're hosting now. We 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 have been for the last couple of years doing on location prayer for Israel for the last two years in the Jacksonville area. Now we've moved it to Zoom. And because there's people outside of Jacksonville that wanted to be a part, and we started last month with our prayer on Zoom. So if you're interested in, in, in connecting on our Zoom prayer call every month for Israel, that will we'll get you on with that as well. But um, so there was the IDF were going into a tunnel, <clears throat> and, and the sergeant came up into this entrance. They went down into the entrance, and they came up to this one spot, and there was an Orthodox rabbi sitting there on a chair, and in the Hamas tunnel. It's like, what are you doing here, Rabbi? What are you doing here? And he says, do not go into this tunnel. If you go into this tunnel, you'll be destroyed. And he said, well, what do you mean don't go? And he says, I'm telling you, do not take your men into this tunnel. You will be destroyed. And he said, 
uh, he, he was just dumbfounded. He couldn't, didn't know what to do. So he went outside, talked to his lieutenant, and the lieutenant and the colonel came down, and they, he was still sitting there. This rabbi just sitting there in a chair in a Hamas tunnel. He said, do not take your men in here. And the colonel went to reach for him, and his hand went through his body. He was an angel sent by the Lord. And they, when he pulled his hand back, this is, these are secular IDF reports. This is not, you know, this is not some, you know, whoever. These are, these are IDF soldiers, and they did not go into the tunnel. Um, don't know what happened, but you're, you're hearing reports of soldiers being protected supernaturally. You're hearing reports of people being protected supernaturally. God is the keeper of Israel. He that keeps Israel neither what? slumbers or sleeps amen so so believe me your prayers are we, we we i know it's it's kind of the cliche thing let's pray for israel but really prayer for israel really is working because as the more that we can in and push through the the darkness in, in the heavenly realm and in the, in the spirit realm it's going to be things like this that are happening and you know, this is what I share with, 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 with church folks a lot. I, you know, I say, look, they, because I, I spoke at a, a chapel at Providence School a couple, about a month ago, and one of the teachers made the statement, well, is Hamas really a terrorist organization? And I'm thinking, okay, let's, let's, let's go back to square one here a little bit and, and talk a little bit about what, what this is. But, you know, first of all, we have to understand two, one single principle. And this is kind of our core our core mantra, our core, what we're saying, is in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, God is entreating Moses one of the eight times. Moses goes to before the Lord and says, and he tells him, go tell Pharaoh, go tell Pharaoh, go tell Pharaoh, right? But this one time he says this, go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son, let my son go. He doesn't say let my people go. He doesn't say let Israel go. He says let my son go. You can read there in chapter 4, verse 22, that they may worship me. But then he says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and, and then as a result, I will have to you know, uh, eliminate the firstborn in Egypt. But my point is, Exodus 4.22, God is very clear in declaring Israel as his firstborn son. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 3, we see another thing happen. We see Yeshua being immersed in the mikvah by Yohanan the Immerser, by John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. He comes out and, and there's a voice of the Father. And what is his voice? The voice of the Father comes a second time and says this, this is my what? Beloved son in, in what? Whom I am well pleased. So we've got two sons, one father, one family. Mm -hmm. So as a believer in Jesus, whether or not we're Jewish or not, doesn't, doesn't matter. We're a part of that family because we're of the same father. And that's why God gave us Abraham as that very picture of the, the sand and the stars in the sky being one representing spiritual sons and daughters that were engrafted in, one being the literal of the earth, you know, the, the, the Jewish people, Israel, attached to Abraham. So we're a part of the same family. And if we can't see that fundamentally as believers, we're not going to connect with Israel. So that, that would be a great way of sharing with, with your friends and family that maybe they're having issues with Israel and they're kind of buying into some of these lies that are being propagated. Um, and so, you know, have you asked yourself the question, for example, why in the world does the LGBTQ movement and Hamas have this, this, this parody? Why are they, why are they connected? I want to answer that question for you. Okay. <laughs> and how, so, you know, it, it, here's it, yesterday or two days ago, uh, the UN ambassador Gilad Erdan of Israel to the UN you know, you, the UN came out with a with a with a uh, resolution against Israel just the other day, and in his speech to the UN, he said, "Let me ask you a question, Mr. President." And, and uh, when you address the floor, you have to address the president, right? You have to address the president. He's Mr. President. He said, "These na Arab nations that have voted for this resolution, Iraq, used to have two hundred thousand plus Jews. Where are they? Lebanon used to have one hundred and fifty thousand Jews. Where are they?" Syria used to have 100,000 Jews. Where are they? They're all gone. So he says, where's the apartheid? Really, where is the apartheid happening? We have Arab Israelis. They vote. They're a part of society. They're even in our Knesset. And he, may, and he makes a very clear statement here that the apartheid is not on behalf of Israel. 
but upon those who have eradicated and ethnically cleansed or displaced all the Jews out of their respective nations. And so these are, these are, these are ways that we can combat the narrative that's really overwhelming our nation right now and this division that's coming. And the, point of, the place of division is, is, is the place of curse. Because Psalm 133 says that, when, you know, behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And then at the last verse of that chapter, it says, God says, it is there I command, not allow, I command my blessing. So when there's division, it's the very opposite of that, right? And that's what Israel had right before the war. They had, a, they had the, probably the worst division since 1948. The worst division. And that was poof, eliminated. Because once that attack came, that was not important anymore. And I think that speaks to our hearts and lives on, every, on an everyday basis, doesn't it? it to show that, that really what it, it, we should reflect upon what's going on there. Put yourself inside of that, if you were inside of that war, inside of that, you know, that nation. What's really important in life at this point? Souls? The kingdom? What can I do in my everyday occupation, in my everyday family? What can I do to further the kingdom of God. That should be our focus. Amen. So, you know, Paul said, the Apostle Paul, Rav Shu said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And if you want to turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 20, we're going to talk a little bit there and, and, and just spend a few moments there. But he says this, he says, this is this, and this is really key for us to understand. He says, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, the Ruach. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 13-15. Explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. And I would encourage you as this congregation grows, and as you, you're studying God's Word, I have been in this movement for a long time, and I've seen congregations flourish, and many times they are dispelled because of, of the reality of thinking to try to cause division over God's Word, over minuscule things that are in the Word. If we're not walking in that Psalm 133 unity, that doesn't mean I don't, I mean, I might disagree with you on the meanings of certain scriptures, but we don't divide our family because of it. Does that make sense? I've seen so many congregations fall and falter and, and go by the wayside because of a lack of unity. And that, and I'm not talking about heretical things. I'm talking about very, very minute, minuscule divisions amongst, you know, we're not going to all agree. God made us different. We all have different ways we were raised, different ways we, were, we grew up, different experiences in life that are going to give us influences in the way we think about certain things, right? So I really believe for the life of the believer, discernment in these days is going to be the most key element in your life. Discernment is going to be the most key element in your life. Not just to discern rightly the, of God's Word, but to discern everyday life. Meaning that I'm open in the spirit realm for the Lord to say, don't take that route to this where you're going. Take that route. And you might think, oh, that's so small. But it could be so big. Mm -hmm. I, I was, this was years ago. And this was, and, you know, I, I, was, I had this argument in the, with the Lord at Walmart one time at the produce. I'm standing in front of the oranges. I'll never forget this. And there's a lady that, I don't know what, what she, was, she was just a short distance from me. And the Spirit spoke to me and said this. Go tell her I've forgiven her for her abortion years ago. I said, God, I am not going up to some strange woman and telling her that at all. And I'm fighting with him about this. And I'm saying, okay, how can I start a conversation that will not be offensive? How can I, how can I, and I'm, I'm just, I, and I, all I did is I went up to her and I said, ma'am, you don't know me, but I believe in Jesus. I believe he forgives sins. And I just felt like the Lord wanted to let you know that he loves you and that whatever went on, several years ago in your life, he's forgiven you for it. That's all I said. She started bawling. And she said, I had an abortion seven years ago. It's, it's moments like these that are going to make us expand the kingdom of God around us, or we can just sit back and do our everyday routines 
and not see the reality of God's kingdom fulfilled in us. Because just like that angel rabbi, orthodox rabbi, had it been anything else but an orthodox rabbi sitting there outside that tunnel, those guys would have been like, we're just going to go right by him, right? You know, But he needed to show them a sign. And isn't that what Jesus said? You, you rabbis, right? You guys require what? A sign. You're always wanting this a sign, right? When's the Messiah going to come? But you are not going to see me again until you say... And, he's, and we say, you know, that's not just some phrase. That is the paramount messianic declaration that any Jewish person can declare, you are the Messiah. And, he, and that's what made them so angry because they had no argument. They had no argument. And so I really believe discernment for you and I. So in, 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 in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and, and I'm just going to uh, just talk a, a Few, just a few words about chapter 19, Jehoshaphat takes the kingdom, okay? And I'm not going to read it, but he, he took the kingdom, and the first thing he did, he started to organize. He put leaders in place, he put mechanisms in place, he put order in place. Up until this point, they were just they were just tribal all over the place, divided. You know, tribes were doing this, one tribe did this, one tribe did that. And he says, okay, let's come together, let's set some order here. You guys take care of the, the military, you guys take care of of uh, 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 the resources you take it and if you read through chapter 19 you'll see he set all of this stuff in order now the first verse of chapter 20 says this it begins with these three words or it, depending on your translation and after this or it came to pass right how many how many have it came to pass anybody have, anybody have that in chapter 20 verse 1 or it says after this is that what it says chapter 20 verse 1 in second Chron. Second Chronicles, yeah, the very first verse of Second Chronicles 20. Now it happened. Okay. Just the three words. Yeah, after this. So in the Hebrew, it's really interesting. What it, that actually translates, it actually translates this. It's the word, the word, the key word there is chaya, and it means because of this. So read it, because of this, because of what? Because of what happened in chapter 19, all the order. We have three tribes that are not of Israel decide to come together and form a union against Israel. Now what's interesting about these three tribes is you have the Moabites, and that's a general Moabite term from, from the West Bank area. And this is really funny. You have the Moabites, the Ammonites from the Gaza area. And then you have, it's either called the Menuhites or the people of Mount Seir, which is in southern, southeastern Israel, which was part where, where um, that area. They hated each other. They did not like each other. It would be like Sunni and Shia Islam. It would be like, you know, these types of things happening. But they decided, they saw what was happening in Israel, that they were becoming united. They, were going, they knew as a result of the tribalism being you know, you know, diluted and them coming together as one people, that they were going to become strong again, right? And as a result, now, they're, they're a little concerned. I'm going to pause, let me put a pause button right there. What has been the narrative with Israel and the, and, and the Gaza? Oh, we need a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. What does a ceasefire do? A ceasefire actually continues the war. What's been Israel's mantra? It's been, we're not going to be done until we have full and complete victory. Right? So you remember World War II? That was, the, that was I mean, the Allies was, no, we're, we're not doing anything until we complete this victory. It's going to be absolutely unequivocal, right? And that's what Israel's been saying. But the world's narrative has been, no, we need a ceasefire. A ceasefire is to keep them tribal is to keep the conflict going because they know if there's complete victory, Gaza is, is now going to become a part of Israel. Well, we have history to prove that, right? We have the Golan Heights. We have East Jerusalem. We have all these other territories that when they, those territories became a threat to Israel, Israel took them. You know, the story of Eli Cohen and all of these things, right? So, so this has been the narrative. I'm trying to pull a parallel between 2 Chronicles 20 and what's actually happening today because it's uncanny how parallel it is. And so then we go on. If we read, keep going. After this, the Moabites, Ammonites, and the sum of the Menuhites, or Mount Seir, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. 
from the other side of the Dead Sea, it is already it is it, it is already in Hezazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for the, for all of Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So, isn't that interesting? What we are doing as believers who are not there, we're fasting and praying. And that's the exact thing that, that Jehoshaphat did. Now, we know the story. I'm not going to, the, the rest of the story is not the, the crux of it. The crux is the parallels of what was going on. The same people groups that they're fighting today are the same people groups that they fought back in the book of Chronicles. And Paul tells us in Second Thessalonians uh, chapter. Well, first of all, I did several years ago. I did a, I did an ad hoc study. I, I I put a question out. To, it ended up being answered by about I don't know three hundred people. I said, "What what is worse? What is the worst of these two scenarios? Believing a lie or telling a lie? Believing a lie or telling a lie? Which is worse?" And ninety percent of the people said, "Well, the Bible says we're not supposed to." To lie, so telling a lie, ninety percent. I would submit to you it's actually believing a lie because even if you hear a lie, you still have a choice whether to believe it or not. And that lie could be actually disposed of its power in your ability to not believe it. But watch this in Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse five. Paul is talking to about the about the end of t the last days, and he says, "Don't do do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now." Talking about the enemy, so that in in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is is already at work. We see that happening throughout the world, and the globalist and the and and the movement to to combine the world's powers and come against the people of of the of the globe as a whole. We're not just seeing it. At internationally by nations. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one who's coming in accord with the, the activity of Satan, with all his power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness. And then it says this, For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will not, so that they will believe what is false. God Himself is going to send a deluding influence, basically something that's false, and they're going to believe it, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the spirit of faith and in truth. Do you not see that that's where we're at today? Those quote-unquote Christians that are believing this false narrative, they're believing a lie. And that is way more affecting what we think is the church. Obviously, if they're believing a lie, are they really a part of the believing community? Is it possible? even think that it's terribly sad i mean it's so sad but it's the reality isn't it i mean it, i have i i have i have a handful of friends that have emailed me and told me that that you are just this 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 is you know that i'm like how do you excuse what happened on october 7th how do you excuse that type of behavior out of the people you are supporting and it's it's a deluding influence. It's a blindness. Amen? And it's, un it's sad, but it, it, it is the case. So how does the LGBTQ community and Hamas, how, how in the world? Because if, if they had any kind of thoughts, if they, knew, if they wanted to be with Hamas, they couldn't exist in that society. They'd be killed. Right. right? So why is it? Because the LGBTQ community, plus, 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 whatever, they're the ones trying to promote a lie as if it is truth. And their, their union with Hamas is that Hamas is believing a lie. They're believing a lie. It's two lies, but they're unionized by the lie. No different than the three tribes that came against Jehoshaphat. Because when there's a union of lies, they'll unionize for a moment. But once that period of time is over, what's the end of the story with Jehoshaphat? How did he win the battle? He didn't have to lift a finger because they, the three tribes consumed themselves. They killed themselves at the end of the day. That's how you pray for Israel. Is Second Chronicles chapter 20. 
so that Israel does not have to put a lot of effort into this, to this thing. That's how we pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. Because when they start seeing things like this, there's going to be Baruch HaBa B'Shem Adonai moments in people's lives. I was a par, I was able to meet six rabbis in 1989, no, sorry, 1999, in Israel. Six Orthodox rabbis who had joined together and they had secretly professed Yeshua as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. If you know the story of Rabbi Kaduri of 2006, he's, he was a part of this group. This group is over 200. And they are staying in secret until such a time as this that they all agree upon that they're at one time and at one moment to stand forward and declare Yeshua is Messiah. Can you imagine 200 Orthodox rabbis at one time in Israel saying Yeshua is Messiah? You talk about an earthquake, about the, I mean, you know, relatively speaking, an earthquake happening in society. That is powerful. But how many people will believe it because it's so many? You can't deny 200. If you're in that community, it's going to be very difficult to deny 200 rabbis all of a sudden declaring this and saying that they and of them their own accord are believing that this is true. This is going on in Israel today. So what we don't know under the, under the covers, we think we're just watching a war here. There's so much more spiritually that's being affected in society of Israel. And I want to encourage you that that's an, I want to tell you it's an encouragement. So keep praying for Israel. Keep standing for Israel. It is so important. I, I'm not going to even have time to get into Obad, uh, Obadiah chapter 1. But I was just going to encourage you to read. I was going to read all of it. We don't have enough time. But read all of Obadiah chapter 1. It was on the Parsha for last week. Okay. Did you already read it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm here, I guess, just to bring confirmation, I guess. <laughs> but if you read it, you could put that next to your next to your drudge report and go. <laughs> right? Right? Because you've got you've got Edom, the West. The West the West is saying, What? Oh no, we're gonna support you. We're gonna we're gonna do some underhanded things against you. But what does God promise? He's promising all throughout Obadiah chapter one, all the things he's gonna do for Israel. Amen. Amen. And I want to, I do want to share this with you because it says Edom's gonna be humbled, that the day of the Lord is coming soon. And how, how many know that that's the, that's the case, right? That, and so next week in the, Vay, the Vayigash, here's what I want to end you with. This is what I want to share with you. Um, and, and, and part of that is Genesis chapter 44, the story of Joseph, right? If you're reading the Parsha, the story of Joseph. Here's the interesting part of this. This is the Torah portion, but it's so powerful of what's happening. Joseph is the forerunner. He's a, he's a forerunner picture of the Messiah, right? All the things that happened to him, we know the story. And... So I do want to pull out just a few points, okay? The, he, he, it comes to the point where he actually holds on to Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know who in Israel claims their lineage is to Benjamin? All the Orthodox claim their lineage to Benjamin. He holds on to Benjamin. The family goes back and does what? Tells the father, you need to come, right? So they come back. And he takes him into a room, takes off his Egyptian garb. How has Jesus been personified to, the, to Christianity for 2,000 years? White, Anglo-Saxon, blonde hair, blue-eyed, Western king. You don't even hear the term Messiah in the church. No. Hardly. Okay, You don't hardly hear it. We don't know as a church in, in the Christian community, we don't know what a Messiah is. Right. We don't understand the concept of Messiah. I'm finishing my, my book on uh, Messiah to Israel and the nations too, and it's explaining what a Messiah is. And we have to embrace the ideal of a Messiah, what that means. Think of it this way. I, I like that this is the simplest form to put it in. A king needs agents and assets. A king needs a military. He needs, he needs, he needs societal government. He needs all of these elements to have a kingdom. If those are destroyed, he loses his kingdom. He can't fight against another entity, right? The Messiah doesn't need assets and agents. He single-handedly went to the kingdom of darkness and defeated it, single-handedly. He chooses to have assets and agents in the form of you and I to be a part of his kingdom. He's that powerful. 
that he can destroy other kingdoms by, you know, we just read by the breath of his mouth. Doesn't need all those assets and all those organizations. But guess what? In that millennial reign, you and I are going to be all a part of that by choice, not by necessity. Difference is, if I'm a king and I need it by necessity, I'm controlling, I'm looking to control my kingdom. But if I'm all powerful and I just love you so much that I just want to employ you in my kingdom, my whole motivation is different. I love you. Mm-hmm. I want you to be a part of my kingdom. I want to employ you in this aspect or that aspect and let you flourish and be a part of what I have to offer. See the difference in mentality? Christians are works-based most of the time. We're works-based about our, our righteousness. We're works-based about our salvation. We're works-based about, about everything. And that's why that is such an evil, evil ideal in theology. And so we realize that the Messiah comes, Yeshua, and when he came, he actually is all-powerful. I don't think most Christians believe he's all-powerful. In fact, only 3% of people read their Bibles. That's just, of Christians read their Bibles. That's just, should be indicator to you. If, they, if I knew, if I really believe Yeshua was all powerful, guess what? I'm in this thing every day, right? Because it's Him. He's a living word. I've got to put more of Him in me. I've got to just, you know. So back to Joseph. Jo- here's Joseph. Joseph is, reveals himself as the forerunner of Messiah, saves the family, saves the kingdom from the famine, right? We know the story. Ezekiel 37, also part of the Parsha for next week. Valley of Dry Bones. You know the story there. Here's how I want to connect it. What happens to Joseph after he dies? He dies. And what does Moses do? Moses takes his bones and moves it to Shechem, which is in the West Bank. Did you know that about... I think it was about 10 years ago, the Palestinians burned Joseph's tomb. Do you think that it was just because he was a religious figure? (laughs) They understand. Ezekiel 37, folks, is not an allegory about just bones in general that Israel comes back to life. It is a picture specifically of Joseph's bones that the house of Joseph is raised back up because Joseph is the forerunner picture of Messiah. So as the bones come to life and the body comes to life, it's a sign of the Messiah that is coming back the second time. Those bones are Joseph's bones in Ezekiel's vision. They're not just a picture of a valley of random bones. You see the connection point? The bones of Joseph were moved. He, if, the, if they weren't important, why did, Moses, why did God tell Moses to move them? And he put them in a place where he knew they were going, there was no way for them to come back to life physically. We see, we, you know, we always talk about Ezekiel 37 as being about Israel, right? It's, 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 and that's true, absolutely true. But I want to take it one step further. I would submit to you that this is about Joseph's bones, meaning that that picture is the house of Joseph, the house of the Messiah being raised. And what is the house of the Messiah? It's one new man. That's why I, when I work with Pastor Selene, you don't get any more rudimentary in one new man than Arab and Jew. Mm-hmm. You just don't get any more rudimentary. That's about as baseline as you can get when you have Arab and Jews working together as believers. We have one for Israel um, ministry connected with Salim that we're working with, and we're we're working together. It's, it's just amazing to see the goodness that's happening in spite of all the tragedy, you know. And so I just want to encourage you today: continue to pray for Israel, continue to. Support it should be it should be literally one of the most foremost things in our minds and hearts because it is for it is for the father. I mean, he calls him his firstborn. I mean, it, I'm leaving, I'm sending my firstborn son to Colorado. I'm driving him to Colorado Springs three days uh, or New Year's Eve just to get him up there so he can fly. He can he can finish you know start what he wants to do missions work with his with his uh, ability to be a pilot. That's his whole goal. He goes on mission trips every year. And so I, I asked the Lord the question. I said, is this what it felt like when Yeshua had to leave, or the son of, your son had to leave and become Yeshua on earth? Is, did, did you have these emotions? Because I didn't think I'd be hit with those things. You know, I'm like going to the grocery store. I'm like, I'm not going to buy that anymore because that's his favorite thing because he won't ever be home again to live here. You know, and things like that. So you just little things just kind of, you know, hit you. And I said, did you feel, I'm, I'm asking God, is that what you felt when he had to, remove himself and become confined to this earthly temple and you know do what he had to do is that did you feel those emotions the same way that i'm feeling about my son you know it's 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 interesting so 
Pray for Israel, the firstborn. Submit, and, and I encourage you, if you, if you connect with any, any Jewish people, especially in this community, and, you know, because Mandarin's so, so full, so many, you know, just, just love on them. And then they'll ask you why you're doing it. And that opens the door. Amen? Amen. Amen. I had to kind of skip through some notes. This could have turned into a couple hours, but, <laughs> but it's great. You already read the text.